Danny Delk, thank you so much for joining us. We really appreciate it. And welcome to Conversations with Curtis. And uh, yes, you're right. We do know who you are. And if you don't know who we are, so let me give you a little, little context. Uh, I know you've uh, done many interviews over the years with uh, gaming enthusiasts and and such. And th this is a little bit different. And it's going to take a couple seconds to kind of go through this. But my name is Paul Stetler, and I, I'm an actor out of Seattle, Washington. Cool. And uh, I primarily work on stage uh, here in the Northwest. And I've done a lot of, you know, TV gigs and voiceover gigs and teaching and all that stuff. I'm not a gamer by any means or never, never have been. Uh, but back in 1996, I was cast as an, as an actor in a full motion video game that was called uh, Phantasmagoria 2, A Puzzle of Flesh by the now defunct Sierra Online. Right. And, uh, and so I, as an actor, I, I had this really great gig as the main protagonist in this kind of horror genre game. Uh, it, it didn't do particularly well. It wasn't a big hit. And then that that particular type of game, which was really a short period where they were trying to make interactive movies uh, with actual live actors, green screen and sets and all that mm -hmm. stuff, it ultimately became too expensive to to maintain. So that kind of fell by the wayside. So as an actor, I didn't really think much about it. I went on with my career. I never did another game, and uh, and years and years went by, and. Back in 2021, I guess it was, during the height of the mm -hmm. pandemic, I had a lot of free time on my hands. I realized it was the 25th anniversary of the making of the game. And people had kind of reached out to me over the years. It, it had found some sort of a of a following. So I just did a, a retrospective. I reached out to the actors, the writer, the director, the designers who made the game. And we just... I just talked to them and we all reflected on what we remembered about the making of that game. And I posted that on YouTube. And it found an audience. And Daniel, being one of them, Daniel's a game developer out of Israel, who is a huge fan and a and a just a a, a vast uh, historical knowledge of all uh, classic adventure games. He reached out to me, and so he and I have now since partnered. And so now what I'm doing now is I'm I'm playing these these adventure games for the very first time. And so I'm playing games that most of these people played when they were teenagers and that they kind of grew up on the, the Monkey Island and all those things. And I'm just having a delightful time discovering them for the very first time. And so when I play some of these new games, I'll, I'll, something will click where I'm like, oh, this person's voice or this, who wrote this or who's that person? And then we try to reach out to those people uh, on the artistic end of things and just see and just continue like this oral history, which goes beyond our game and into the those classic games from the past. So all that all leads us to to you. So Daniel introduced me to the Monkey Island games a few months ago. And the very first game was the first one. And the voice that just completely uh, stood out to me was the citizen of Melee Island. Oh, okay. Uh, which you may not even remember anymore, but that oh, was the the... Okay, so the guy that was on the the street corner who sold the map, and I remember thinking, "Wow, what a voice! That 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 voice is just uh, tremendous." And then, as the game went on, I would be able to identify, "Oh, is that the same guy?" And then your name kept coming up. We played some more of the games, and then of course Murray shows up in uh, in Curse, and uh, and so it's just been uh, you've been on our list of someone to talk to uh, for a while now. So we really want to thank you for taking the time to. Sure. to uh to do that so yeah um i think it might be a good thing to if daniel if you have it queued up it might be fun to start with sharing that voice or that character with with denny and then we yeah, can uh, sure. talk Just a little bit about but what you remember from that excuse me but do you have a cousin named sven <laughs> no but i once had a barber named dominique close enough Let's talk business. You want to buy a map to the legendary lost treasure of Melee Island? Only one in existence. Rare. Very rare. Only 100 pieces of eight. That's so great. that was the scene. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah, and it's funny. I, I since since we I played it with Daniel and we streamed it in front of our fans. I I then introduced it to my family. I have a thirteen year old and a ten year old, and they both on their own were like, "Oh, I love that voice. Who is that guy?" And they they really wanted to. They they just so so that was their favorite character. And we were all so bummed that the citizen of Melee Island didn't have a a bigger part or didn't come back into the other uh, into the other games. But thank goodness you were able to voice some other iconic characters. So I guess just to start, um, here's what I'd like to know, just to be, just to kind of start at the beginning. At what point in your life, once, I mean, I imagine puberty hits, your voice changes. At what point do you go, <laughs> at what point do you realize your voice is, has, has that kind of timber or that it has a, a unique quality that you can, can actually make use of? Um, I think it was after the first bottle of scotch, but um, <laughs> yeah, so think, it was a fourteen, fifteen. <laughs> um, yeah, um, having having worked in a lot of different markets over time, um, and I, I would imagine that uh, uh, Seattle is pretty much the same. I never spent much time there, but for instance, if you work in New York, you do stage. If you work in Los Angeles, you do TV and radio. San Francisco was always known for advertising. And then suddenly they developed, uh, um, actually, a friend of mine and I did some of the first voices on uh, a game out of Silicon Valley, which I cannot think of. It was some sort of an adventure game. And the uh, uh, producers had done their own voices, and it sounded like Bill and Ted's Excellent Adventure, if you remember that movie. Uh, oh, yeah. going to get you bad, dude. No, you're not good, dude. And um, so it, it was one of those things where um, you know, developing uh, the ability to do lots of voices kind of came naturally. Are you familiar with a guy by the name of Paul Fries? Uh, he was a very big uh, uh, voiceover guy. He did he did two can Sam for Fruit Loops. He did um, the oh, Jolly yeah, the, yeah, oh, yeah. Oh, oh, the Jolly Green Giant. He was also the uh, Pillsbury Doughboy. <laughs> And I mean, his range was incredible. And and having worked with him early on in my career was like, well, try it. You know, they can only say no. <laughs> so, you know, yeah. we did a lot of things. And in fact, Monkey Island was one of the first uh, where we got our video game people to producers, in fact, to um, let us do some some improvisation. And um, San Francisco was a big town for improvisation. So, you know, we'd, we'd create our own. We'd have the scripted lines, which we'd record. But then we'd do other weird, you know, out of out of the park kinds of things. And, oh, I like that. I love that. Um, the producers, in fact, their favorite character, or at least they've told me repeatedly, was Murray. Murray the Skull. Murray, I'm going to put a curse on you. And, uh, in fact, they uh, <laughs> asked, asked me to record a uh, telephone answering machine loop for them for their uh you know asking you know, murray telling the uh, caller leave a message i murray the demonic skull will give it to them so <laughs> well that's great that's great um yeah so i mean the, one of the real delights of all of the uh monkey island games are, are all those repetitive like if you can just go down a whole bunch of rabbit holes of of asking certain questions and getting numerous answers and a lot of repetition and humor that comes along with that. So it's neat to know that that not only were you, of course, you know, being being true to the to the script, but having some flexibility and having fun being able to. Now I imagine with those first two games, because they were originally done without voices and had been played for many years. I guess that that in those first two games, you probably had to stay stay true to what was already there. Or was there some flexibility in those too? They, they, they allowed us, you know, not being in the final production um, piece of it, uh, and not being uh, much of a gamer myself. I do play a few, but uh, so I'm not sure what's in there originally, and have really not gone back to look. But um, you know, they got excited when we worked on it, and uh, it was one of the things that. Uh, you know, I was there at the start of the gaming world when you still had um, uh, Pac-Man and uh, some of the others were just bloop, 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 as you would go chasing something. And when they started bringing in voices, uh, you know, it became very interesting. In fact, uh, I was very involved with uh, AFTRA, the American Federation of Television and Radio Artists at the time. And uh, so we got a call, uh, a friend of mine and I, who were both actors, said, we'd like you to come help us with this. And... Uh, said, okay, fine. We went to see what they were looking at and uh, said, 
well, that's great, but we have no idea what to charge you. <laughs> this is whole new ground. You know, what do we do? Yeah, so, yeah. That, that's what exactly. the local after all. At that point, you probably don't. And and at that point, I'm curious how things have, have changed. But, you know, back in the day, you're doing commercials and there's residuals and there's right. a certain fee structure. And then, but with video games, I imagine, how do you even figure out the, you know, is it, was it a flat fee to start with? Did it ever get to a point where you were, were making anything off of i don't know sales or uh, how did how did that uh it, it, did uh, come about you know there's there's been talk about uh, uh, a sales bump but nobody's achieved it yet although there have been incredible <laughs> increases in fees uh over the years but um the um the interesting part of uh the gaming payout i, I don't think most games have a shelf life longer than like 18 months for mm -hmm. sale because after 18 months, you better have a new version. And uh, for instance, with uh, uh, the um, Monkey Island series, I'm, we've got to have done eight of them. Uh, you know, Treasure Monkey Island, uh, Quest for Monkey Island, uh, whatever from you know, a whole bunch. And so most of the characters that everybody likes, you know, uh, uh, you know, with the uh, Lechuk and uh, Murray and some of the others that are out there, you know, you better bring back the real ones because people will rise up on their hind legs and say, that's not Murray. Mm -hmm. You know, so you know, it, was, it was it was a nice payout to start with. And then, oh, we're going back after a year and a half and going to redo some stuff. So it was good and it was fun. And, uh, you know, prices uh, are have grown exponentially. And um, that's good. It's, it's interesting, interesting to have the following. I get the uh, things from people all the time who found me out, you know, can I get your autograph? Well, send me something. I'll well, do that. And no, well, that's funny. It, it's a... <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, you know, it's, 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 it's humbling to think that something you did, you know, well, you've just done a recent version of it, but when you, you know, some of the things that you've done in the past have had such a uh, profound effect on, 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 and Dan, you can reach you. You can speak to this in terms of how uh, you, being a, a gamer, when and kind of discovering this when you were a kid, how how these voices, how these games really helped uh, in many ways. Um, you know, you develop who you are and in, in your interests, right? Yeah, no, my my first introduction to your wonderful voice acting was in the floppy disk version of Day of the Tentacle. Now, unlike the CD-ROM version, which came out at the same time. The floppy disk version only had the intro voiced. The rest of the game was just text like the old adventure right. games because there was not enough space on the floppy disks. And so I mainly got to hear you as purple and green tentacle in a time in which voices coming out of the computer was basically witchcraft. <laughs> um, but this was a uh, um but this was during a time in which voice acting in computer in computer games was still it's in infancy and didn't get the respect that it deserved. And so having you as someone with such a great voice, voice some of these characters was very surprising because up until that point, uh, games like, for example, King's Quest V were voiced by Sierra employees. They didn't get actual voice actors or professionals to voice them. They just, you saw someone in the hallway, you asked him to come into the recording booth and record King Graham or whatever. And so what made you take this project in such a time in which voice acting in computer games was still a niche? Well, I, yeah, and, what and, was the, yeah. And, and also play several major characters in Day of the Tentacle. Yeah, well, like, it was, yeah, it was it was purple tentacle, green tentacle, George Washington, and Hoagie. It, it was it was all fun because um, it, it was almost like doing cartoons, which is another favorite thing of mine, uh, and and being able to take a lot of license and and uh, as I said, you know, create the character. Uh, I mean, the the piece you had a little bit ago of you know one of the original uh, Monkey Island things. Yeah, I mean the, the graphics are. You know, so seventies. You know, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. And stuff like that now, you know, is is. I mean, it's it's almost uh, you know film theater quality. 
Um, and so it's 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 really really very interesting to do. But I mean, uh, King's Quest. I did a few of those after they realized that they needed to, you know, bump up their game. I a know little. you did King's Quest Seven. I believe that was the one. Yeah, and then you know we also yeah, had... you were King Otar the Third. <laughs> <laughs> he knows. He knows. Um, but you know we also did uh, you know uh, um, I, I still get people who. Uh, you know, say you taught me chess because we did chess master and um mm -hmm. we had the narrator there yeah and um one of my favorite stories is is some years ago uh we done all the star wars things because lucas was right there and uh, i'd done some cartoons for lucas and so uh, uh i was one of the picks to come be part of the lucas gaming family and um uh, we we did pretty well you know most of them were focused on the uh the star wars stuff and they had tie fighter and all these other things and most of them twitch games you know uh but anyway um i was i was in macy's trying to buy a pair of shoes and this guy who uh had you know really long hair uh even for san francisco and working for macy's had really long hair but he was the shoe guy and so <laughs> We're walking through the aisles looking at shoes, and he says, man, I know your voice. And I said, well, I do commercials and stuff. He says, that's not it, but I'll think of it. And so we finish doing the shopping. He puts my shoes in the bag, and he says, could you say follow me through the pylons and stick close? And it was I was the instructor for almost all of the uh, little Twitch games that they did with you know piloting the, the uh, various StarCraft. And uh, you know, giving you uh, the directions and uh, you know, pull up, pull up, and that sort of thing. So he had a really good ear. Unfortunately, he was selling shoes all the time. So, <laughs> <laughs> so, so you're you're based out of San Francisco now, and probably have been. How long have you been in in the, the Bay Area? Well, um, I'm uh, I'm bi coastal. If you consider that uh, the Gulf Coast is another coast, um, so I split my time between San Francisco and. Uh, Corpus Christi, Texas, and um, oh, okay, great. We moved to uh, uh, California in the late seventies, and uh, have recently started up uh, down here in Corpus. Uh, my uh, mother-in-law is up the road a couple of hours from where we are, as nice. my very intelligent wife says, "We're close, but not too close." And uh, <laughs> so, uh, so we get to uh, run up there from time to time. And um, nice. I mean, I'm sitting here in my studio in Corpus. And um, just finished hooking up with uh, New York, and before that, with um, some folk in uh, in actually um, just outside of London, uh, and that was another gig. So, as long as you oh, got the internet, absolutely. Well, I want to talk a little bit. I, I'm gonna. I want to see if I can. I know we'll we're gonna we'll, we'll break this up. We won't take up too much of your time, but I I'm I'm very curious and just uh, and. and and your your background and and how things have changed. I did enough voiceovers back in the day that I know how much it's you know uh, it's changed. I want to get into that. And then then we'll definitely uh, we have a number of voices queued up for you. And I know Daniel will have some more specific questions to uh, to cater to the the people that know all your voices as well as as he does. Um, make, but where did make, make, did you start off? One, oh, sorry. So just make Daniel stop his wall from moving. Okay, it's getting really creepy. It does. It gets a little. Uh, <laughs> I'll change my background. <laughs> I've been seeing it for a long time, and it still it still mesmerizes. Um, so, were you born in Oklahoma? Did I read that? Is that yeah. where you originally grew up? Yeah. So, tell me a little bit about uh, your your. You know, where did you whereabouts? Was it Tulsa? Whereabouts were you? And but your family. What was the family dynamic like back in back uh, in the day? Tulsa was a grand place to grow up. It was. Uh, um. Oh, what should I say? A, a place where you could still, you know, play outside into the evening and uh, do all those sorts of things. Uh, I would had always been attracted to performance, um, and I, I actually blame my career choice and and where I wound up on my mother uh, because when we were little kids, you know, like five years old, and she would put us down for a nap, and she would read us a story so that we could uh, have something to, uh, you know, make our minds uh, spin while we're sleeping. And if she read us the three Billy Goats gruff, each of the Billy Goats had a different voice. So. Oh, so she really began the process of like a, the opening it up that you can be 
you can take on so many different uh, characters. I got permission long, long ago. Oh, that's great. That's great. Anyway, the, the family dynamic was, was uh... everybody else is uh, in medicine uh, except me. And um, <laughs> although I have had more clients. I can relate. <laughs> I've had more clients that uh, I used to be the voice of the American Academy of Ophthalmology. Um, several other medical type things. And primarily it's because I grew up not speaking Latin or hearing Latin spoken, but hearing doctorese spoken because doctors don't do it the way the Latin scholars do. And uh, mm. so, yeah, I was uh, for, for about 12 years, I was teaching doctors how to do uh, various eye surgeries. And uh, the, uh, well, my wife had uh, wow. a few years ago had, uh, uh, cataracts done you know i said oh yeah fake emulsification just no this is my surgery let me tell the story um but uh <laughs> yeah or the, uh, the the doctors at one point said you know you record all this stuff for us and it's all very good but you never see the pictures and you want to do you want to ever look at uh, what's going on i said no that's why i didn't become a doctor yeah exactly that's why you play one on uh, on the radio yeah um and then what uh, What was the, when you left Tulsa, was it to go to university or were you already decided to uh, to make your mark and, and get to a, a bigger city to kind of pursue this? And, and what ultimately led you away from maybe uh, on camera, on stage acting and to, you know, to focus primarily on your voiceover? Um, well, let's see, the, the first part of that would be primarily that... Um... I started in radio uh, in high school. I actually uh, had a job at a uh, little radio station in Tulsa that uh, they had a sign painted on their door. It said dollar a holler. And I would do weekend disc jockey stuff and, and that sort of thing. Um, but oh, awesome. I had a bad habit of, uh, um, what should I say? My, uh, my sense of humor is almost always on. So uh, the the problem that I had was I'd get thrown out of class in high school, even in junior high. Uh, I'd, I'd get a job at a radio station or a TV station. I'd last, you know, six to eight months. You're fired. Um, and uh, <laughs> I, when when I started got, getting, you know, finally got to a market, which was San Francisco, that was big enough to uh, uh, make freelancing a living, uh, mm -hmm. I realized that all those skills that I developed in getting thrown out of class were exactly what I needed to achieve my goal in voiceover, just being a wiseacre. Yeah. Can you, do you have a good story or a memory of what, uh, of a particular moment that got you fired? Oh, um, gosh, any number of them. Uh, <laughs> I suppose the, uh, was a, uh, uh, by that time we were in San Jose, California, and um, there was a, it was a, a news type station and I was hired to be the, um, it was still a disc jockey, but it was disc jockey who played newsmen rather than playing records. Okay. So the newsman came in and had his, uh, his kicker story at the end of the thing was that in San Diego, there was a strike going on among the uh, the fishermen uh, who were not going out fishing and that it was, uh, you know, entirely, um, you know, you couldn't get fresh fish and so on and so forth, so on and so forth. And I said, so they're not letting them go out and cast a net? <laughs> when I got off, back, said, You're that's out. good stuff. <laughs> oh my gosh, uh, that's people don't have good. Oh, the lack of sense of humor that's out there—that's crazy. <laughs> that's wonderful. Um, and then you know the thing that uh, I see your your studio. You're in your studio in your home, and that was not how it was back in the day, right? Back in the day, you would get hired. Your agent would probably call you up, and you'd go down to. The, various studios i'm sure you got to know all the technicians you'd walk into a room <laughs> either audition or do your job and so everything you weren't in any way responsible for the technology or you were there to, to do your job nowadays you are as much of a technician as you are a, a voiceover artist i'm curious how how much what do you miss and what do you like about the new way of, of you know of, of how to of how the voiceover world has changed what I, what I miss is the people. Um, I have friends in every market in the country that uh, uh, have been doing this sort of thing. And uh, 
you know, we're coming to a place in my cycle of life when the friends are starting to, we're starting to lose them, put it that way. And um, it's been about a year ago that a friend of mine, his name is Craig, he was in New York City and he was the voice of uh, CBS for a long time. And um, anyway, he passed away. And uh, so uh, one of our friends set up a, a Zoom call, but it was like, you know, a thousand people or whatever, it was just a huge number of people on the Zoom call. And uh, everybody was sitting in their um, their little studios at their house, you know, and uh, talking about Craig. And uh, somebody finally made the observation, you know, this is the most people I've been with, you know, in, in the past five years in, in any kind of recording situation and you know, any kind of technical situation because nobody goes anywhere anymore with other people it's just it it's it's a missing thing but when when i started i actually had a bit of a leg up because uh one of my uh buddies from uh, junior high school his dad was a, a hi-fi aficionado back when you had reel-to-reel tape and all that other stuff and we used to go over to his house and we would uh, concoct our own radio shows and we would be different people and we play, you know, play music and whatever. And uh, so we put together a little 15 minute radio show and uh, it was just, you know, our way of burning up time. Yeah. But then in the meantime, you're learning, the, you're learning uh, all the stuff, you know, learning what, what works and what doesn't work and having yep. to work with the equipment and all that. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Do you enjoy uh, your, you know, sort of running your own home studio? Uh, have you figured out all the, all, all the details to make that work it may it's very convenient the uh the software and everything is i mean it's, it's very funny um we had a studio for the longest time in san francisco that uh, the guy who owned it um was head of uh, i think the, the acronym is spark anyway it's the professional recording engineers uh club or something i don't know but um, you know they're always involved with pushing the new technology and uh when um uh, the uh, Pro Tools people come out and started using Pro Tools. You know, he was convinced that he was going to lose hundreds of thousands of dollars in his studio because it's so simple to edit and you can, you know, edit all you want and then you can just unedit, unedit, edit, unedit. It's not like you're slicing tape and all that sort of stuff. And you can pitch it up, you can pitch it down, you can speed it up, you can slow it down. He said, you know, they're going to get done. You know, I, I charge for an hour minimum, but it usually takes three hours to get, you know, a, a good spot done. He says, they're going to be gone in an hour. I'm going to lose two thirds of my income. And talk to him a, a couple of months later after he'd had installed the uh, the test stuff for us. He says, no, actually, uh, we doubled the time because you can do so much stuff to it. Every producer wants to see, well, what would it be like if we were to yeah yeah too much choice right now you can now the sky's the limit and that's that's fascinating um wow that's great that's great well let's daniel i know you've got a number of things that you, you've got lined up and we'd love to share some of uh your your voices that you've done denny and to kind of hear your your memories and thoughts about that so daniel feel free to Take it away okay, from here. I'll share. Or I'll share the intro I was talking about for Day of the Tentacle, and I have a question about it. Mm, I'm thirsty. I don't think you should drink that. It looks bad for you. <laughs> Nonsense! It makes me feel great. Smarter, more aggressive. I feel like I could. Like I could. <laughs> like I could. Take, Take all the world. So that was that was the clip, the iconic intro for Day of the Tentacle. Now I it's have funny, a... my first time seeing it. It really is so reminiscent of those Saturday morning cartoons I grew oh, yeah. up with. That mm -hmm. must have been really fun. Yeah. Now I have a question about the intro. Uh, how do you handle working on multiple characters in the same game? For example, you're both these characters. 
So how can you keep their voice distincting enough so that people won't notice that it's you in both <laughs> instances? Because, for example, our viewers, when we told them that we're getting Danny Delk, that most, most of them know you as Murray and as Purple Tentacle. But they didn't know that you're also Green Tentacle and that you're also Hoagie and, and George Washington. So that means that they were unable to recognize your voice in Green Tentacle's voice. So how do you keep those distinct even if? Well, you try and pull things out that um, you know are not uh, parallel. Uh, I mean, obviously, Purple Tentacle is is you know scheming and evil and... Uh, you know, Hoagie was one of my favorites because uh, he was sort of a country hippie, you know, was, uh, uh, you know, like, <laughs> oh, yeah, but um, it was that guy from the store you talked about. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> but you find those things that that don't parallel. And one of the things that I recollect, it's been a long time since I've seen it, but uh, the George Washington, you know, everybody made fun of his his wooden teeth. Well, actually, they were hippopotamus tusks, but that's OK. Uh, but uh you know, ma making him sound a little different, as I recollect the uh, the character, because they just weren't fitting properly. But um, all those, <laughs> right. That's all those different things. Um, I suppose the the one thing that uh, yeah, th there's actually another voice. It's not a game voice, but uh, that uh, I did. Uh, it's been thirty years ago now, but um, the, the they couldn't under they they couldn't figure out what they wanted when we did it. Um, the um, uh, we'd done the body of the commercial two or three different times as a guy sitting there listening to the radio. And uh, so we did it as a, as a top 40 DJ. We did it as a uh, AOL, you know, middle of the road kind of uh, uh, DJ. We did it as a country DJ and finally said, uh, uh, we did the last one. We said, well, we got a tagline on here. We'd like you to do that. And um, so I said two words, got milk. And uh, it played for 25 years and kept paying residuals the whole time. <laughs> yeah, I read that that you were the got milk guy. That I mean, that was boy, what a I was in the, the right two place best right words time. of your career, right? Yeah, well, I, was, I, I was being interviewed with a bunch of uh, other uh, folks by a talk show out of uh, Chicago, and um, one of the guys, one of the hosts of the show, said, uh, "Do you ever feel, you know, like embarrassed or or in any way that like you know two words and it's been paying you all this time, you know?" Does, does that ever bother you? I said, no, because when we originally, no. When we originally recorded, I, after we finished what they wanted, I said, would you like me to record, have you got milk? So when you get letters from English teachers, we'll be able to, you know, change it over. And they said, no, we don't want that. So I'm clear. I'm clean. <laughs> oh, that's great. I love it. Boy, that went on for how many years did that did that stick around? That's still no one no one's forgotten that. Twenty five. Dang, that's so so great. That's so great. All right, Daniel, what else you got? I'm sure you got a million more oh, little. Okay, first of all, I want to show the got milk. Oh, okay. yeah. Alexander Hamilton, that famous duel. All right, let's go to the phones and see who's out there. Aaron Burr. Hello? Hello, for $10,000, who shall... <laughs> I'm afraid your time is almost up. I'm sorry, maybe next time. <laughs> Got milk. <laughs> And I like how you just underplayed it. Like it just was okay. such a, <laughs> well, that's it, a it's, great it's, commercial. Uh, the, the whole series was great fun. And uh, it was a um, uh, fellow in San Francisco by the name of Jeff Goodby, who, who uh, you know, was, was the motivator behind the entire series. And I mean, they're all, you know, oh my heavens, how did, uh, you know, is it the guy who thinks he's in heaven and he opens the refrigerator and all the milk cartons are there, but they're all empty. And realizes he's in hell. <laughs> yeah, that's great. I also love that this clearly was the uh, inspiration for Lin Manuel Miranda for Hamilton. So that that's good. You know, twenty five <laughs> years ago, thirty years ago. Now, now I'm going to play Hoagie. Look, Hoagie, it's a hamster. Just what I need for dissection lab tomorrow. 
I think I need that for the band, Laverne. You know, like we could bite its head off or whatever. So That's that great. was hokey. That's so good. And this is George Washington in the same game. Excuse me. Yes? Mr. President, may I offer you an excellent smoke? Can you also provide me with a light? Sure. Well, in that case... <laughs> nice. <laughs> Blast, I hate it when that happens. See if you can't find those for me, will you? There's a good lad. <laughs> That's good <laughs> stuff. Now, so yeah, we... you get to uh, do, do you. Uh, I, my my guess, and I think Daniel was asking this earlier, is that my guess is that you record all one voice first. And then you do the other one, but do you ever play around and just do just just bounce off? Since you had, were you able to ever just do both the voices and and at the same time and just kind of have that conversation? You uh, have the, I'm sure you have the skills set to do that. It, it, probably it fun been, for you to do that. Yeah, it would have been interesting to try, but the 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 um the production state uh, standard at the time, um, you'd always do animation, do uh, uh, cartoons and that sort of thing. As a gang, everybody's in the studio. You're playing off each other, bouncing off each other. Part of the, the tough part of doing uh, the uh, the gaming stuff, uh, particularly if it's, it's something that's uh, needs to have a lot of emotion or or uh, you know uh, shrieking and carrying on, is you're there by yourself with the recording engineer, mm -hmm. and producer, and so you have to achieve those different levels of uh, uh, development um, on your own. So it, it is you know. Uh, Kind of str striated now okay we're going to do george washington until we get all of george washington and we're going to go do hoagie and you know and um in fact every once in a while i, I recall when we were doing things that uh you know i was doing two characters that were talking to, to each other um that uh, you'd have to uh okay pl play me him again one more time I need, I need to... yeah you'd have to hear yourself to yeah, yeah. that makes sense yeah so that you can respond in a way that is 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 true to the what was given to you, right? I'm always impressed by the uh, the Simpson Simpsons people because uh, each of them is doing at least three characters in every show, and uh, you know they keep them uh, keep them far enough apart. I mean, it's 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 wonderful. Harry Shearer is one of my favorites. He's very very funny. So, yeah, yeah, he sure is. Sure is. Did you find it difficult to return to characters that you've done years ago because? when you did Curse of Monkey Island, it was 97. And then when you voiced the first and second Monkey Island special editions, it was 2009 and 2010. And well, at the same year, you also had Tales of Monkey Island. So you had at least a decade, or more than a decade between recordings. And then with Return to Monkey Island, you had another decade to wait for the other sequels. So basically 13 years at a time, every time. Well, the, the, I think the, the biggest thing is probably uh, the position of the producer. Because producers, uh, I mean, it's, it's like any director, uh, you know, oh, we're going to remake King Kong, okay? And the director says, you know, I, w I wasn't really impressed with the way they did that. So, uh, you know, we're going to make, uh, um, you know, the, uh, the hero on the boat, uh, it's going to be Jeff Bridges instead of, uh, I can't remember who it was. But anyway, um, you know, and uh, so it's it's Jeff Bridges. He's not going to be a suave. He's going to be more of a, uh, you know, a, a punk, long hair, bearded guy. And uh, it's going to change what goes on. So um, it is, I, I think it's, you know, I, when I come to it, I will come to it as I remember it. Uh, I can even listen to, you know, parts of the game sometimes. Uh, they'll, they'll have that on hand. But again, I'm working for the producer. The producer gets to tell me. It's not quite what I want. I like it more. Mm -hmm. Could you do it as Garbo? I don't know. Yeah, right. What was it like? Because uh, you worked. I'm. Did you work with Ron Gilbert 
prior to return when you was he around for the, he was was he not around for the um uh for the voices of the first couple of games well, you know it's it's been so long ago and i you know i have, have not kept up with with many of the people usually i would be um you know they, they'd have a line producer kind of person who would uh, be the one responsible so you know gotcha. I, uh you know um there's a lady named chris brown who uh, i've worked with now for over 20 years and uh she actually, um they had decided they wanted uh, not to record at lucas which was always a, a treat because of being up in Marin like that, but they'd found a little recording studio in Marin that was up in the hills. And uh, so she drove up and we all drove up to the, the recording studios in a glade, very picturesque little uh, road that was carved out of the side of the mountain to get to it. Anyway, she parked her car and as she was getting out of the car, the one of the wheels was hanging over the precipice and started to... Oh, oh my uh, gosh. So I ran over and, uh, you know, grabbed the other end of the car and pushed down really hard. It was some little tiny uh, thing. Uh, and I pushed down and said, Chris, get back in the car, pull it up so that you're on solid ground. She still, whenever we, we talk, she says, you saved my life that day. <laughs> <laughs> good. You got that on her. That's good. <laughs> More work for you. <laughs> Sweet lady. Yeah. Now, now, Mary was a fan favorite when uh, Curse of Monkey Island came out. And as a testament to that was the fact that even though that game wasn't by Ron Gilbert, uh, he still chose to bring you back for Return to Monkey Island, even though most of the events and characters from the non-Ron Gilbert sequels were ignored or set aside in that sequel. Now, how did you make that character so iconic? Because from what I've heard, uh, at first, Mary had a minor role in the game and then after they heard your voice they changed a lot of the plot to make murray a more prominent character in the game itself well, is that uh, true I, it, yeah it, it when we started out uh they didn't know what to do with murray somebody had decided to to draw this character in and uh so they I mean, they, they said we we don't know we we just don't know and i said well let's let's play with him a little bit you know first of all um He's got to be frustrated. He's a skull and he can't do anything. <laughs> and, you know, he keeps yeah. saying, come over here. I'm going to bite you. I'm going to. And um, the um, uh, the other thing is, I mean, Murray is traditionally a good New York Jewish name. And, and so we made Murray have a little bit of an old Jewish accent. Now, over the years, various producers said, nah, I don't know. We want to continue. This. So he just became an old guy, you know, more of more that direction than the other way. But uh Come over here. I'm going to put a case on you. I am demonic. Don't yell at it. Go here. Come back here. <laughs> and the thing is, he was probably so good at being bad when he had his whole, when he was alive and had his body, that <laughs> no one respects what he used to be, right? <laughs> all, all those things folded. But, you know, the, the Murray's frustration is what sells Murray. You know, he's just absolutely stuck there on the uh, on on the uh, credenza or the uh, the uh, bedside table or wherever they've they've got him propped up. You wonder how he moves from one place to another, but he just happens to be there. So, <laughs> but he's still. Well, I think it's a great. I, we we I, I stumbled upon a video uh, somebody made. Well, I guess I'll just let Daniel show it. But um, this just goes to show the the depth and the breadth of how Murray has uh, influenced uh, many people. So take, <laughs> take a look at this. I'm not sure if you've seen this before. I don't think but. so. My words, I shall return to haunt you. So they created uh, an animatronic. So he... So all he has to do is put his hand nearby and you'll get a, a... <laughs> isn't that something? Oh yeah. I'm really high widow speak. You're a sad, strange little man. Isn't that great? Isn't that something? 
So taking your voice, putting it, creating this. So that's just, again, just, you know, you never know when you're doing what you're doing, how it can have such a ripple effect of how it oh, affects yeah. people in a fantastic way. That's so great. Now I want to share a few more clips. Sure. Um, in Indiana Jones and the Fate of Atlantis, which was released the same year, the CD-ROM version, which was released the same year as Day of the Tentacle, you were Omar El jabbar Are you Mr. Omar Al jabbar I am but a humble shopkeeper. My name is unimportant. Do you ever deal in antiquities from Atlantis? Maybe I do, maybe I don't. Many a fool dreams of the Lost Kingdom. How may I know your intentions are serious? Are you Mr. Omar Al Jabbar? I am but a humble shop. One more clip. <laughs> and the fact, you know, I, I, it's mind blowing to think that a lot of these games I played as a kid, and I only recently found out that you voiced all of these characters. Again, I knew about Murray and Purple Tentacle, just like most of our viewers, but the fact that Omar Al Jabbar and the narrator in Monkey Island 2 as well, and in Sam and Max, see the road you were Shep and Burl, if you remember the Siamese twins. See this melted block mm -hmm. of ice? How could we miss it? This used to be our main attraction. Your main attraction was a block of ice? Don't be dense. Our main attraction was a genuine, authentic, real life, Bigfoot on ice. Hey, let me get this straight. You want us to go traipsing all over the country looking for a soggy Bigfoot? I've never been traipsing before. Does it hurt? But Bruno must be returned to us. I can't tell which voice is yours. They could all be yours. A beast with no sense the, of uh, He's the, the Siamese twins. Hey, who yeah, both it? of them. The, the Siamese twins. Melted block of ice. Gotcha. How could we miss it? This used to be. So yeah, it's it's always interesting that you're not only voicing um, several characters in the same game, but you're voicing characters that you can hear talking one after the other or talking to each other, and you still don't notice that it's the same voice actor. Yeah. So that's <laughs> the interesting part. Thank you, thank you. And we heard we heard uh, Murray, and we have you're also the narrator in Allen too. Mm -hmm. Deep within LeChuck's fortress, blah, 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 blah. <laughs> That's good Deep stuff. Le That's great. I love and... that. I love that sense of humor of that, of those games. There's just a real sense of, you know, they making fun of what they're doing as they're doing it, you know, and then just the oh, voices that... in general. And I know, you know, uh, like myself, uh, Danny, I, you know, it makes sense that you don't go back and watch or, or, you know, you, you not, most actors don't watch their own stuff or go back and listen to it because you're moving forward and it's it's harder to have real perspective uh, on your own work. But uh, um, but what, what I took from those watching the Monkey Island games was, you know, I had never played the games growing up, so I didn't have the experience that a lot of the players did where they didn't have voices for many years and then they came back to it and they heard these voices. I just got to hear the, the, but the voices are so good. They're, they're all so good. And, and whoever, and to, to think that they hired voice talent who individually went in and did the voices and that they created, you know, cause there's something about what, what makes live, what, what makes performance makes or breaks performances. Everybody needs to be in the same world. Right. And if, if there is a character or an actor who's just not quite in the same world that everybody else is, it really stands out. And what's fascinating to me about those Monkey Island games is that everybody fits, you know, everybody understood what they were creating and was able to bring their own version to it. But it all fit within. And and I thought you were, you know, just a perfect ringleader for that kind of, uh, you know, for those for those the voices that you provided. Well, I blame a lot of it again on San Francisco. We had a, an incredible uh, cadre of uh, performers, and, and you know that uh, everybody did everything. I mean, the, the same people who went on stage uh, in, in the theater district also did comedy or improv, and also did commercials and you know whatever. And when we started, um, you know, 
doing voices and and showing people you know what could be done we had this this incredible cast to draw from and i remember when again a lucas project we were doing um the ewoks cartoons and we had a cast that were uh almost all of them were were comedically oriented so you know we get in the room together and uh you know just uh you know throw stuff around and you know you always cut it out it's not a problem but there's something you know really worked and we had a a really sick group of uh writers in uh in those days because uh they were always trying to sneak stuff past the censors um and um uh, so you know we'd uh I, I remember we went up to uh to the Lu lucas uh a set if you know and it really was a set it was the office but it was uh up at lucas ranch and he had built it to look as though it were a, a 19th century farmhouse with all the outbuildings. The barn was the production room and this, that, and the other. We walked into uh, his office. He wanted to meet the people who were going to play his Ewoks. And uh, he was standing there behind his desk, and there's a big window behind him, you know, one multiple panes of glass, sort of French door latticed in. And there was a dead tree outside. It was uh, it was in the, uh, uh, in the fall. All the leaves had fallen off. And uh, so we're meeting him and talking to him, and suddenly a very large California golden eagle flies down and lands on the uh, one of the branches. And one of our guys who had, you know, it was just quick. He was a comic. He was great to work with. And he said, man, your animatronics are killer. <laughs> Boy, <laughs> perfect timing. Got it right. It just came on down. Oh, that's great. That's and they great. probably know that Lucasfilm has the budget for such things. Oh, yeah. Um, they did. Yeah. yeah, right. Yeah, what a joy it must be when you actually are able to be in a room with these these other artists and other, you know, and to be able to riff off each other. Because like you said, most of the time you're doing it on your own and they have to edit that together. But uh, how fun it must be when you get to do that. Well, we had a, we had a group that we uh, had on the boards for 20 some odd years. You may remember um, a group that had originally come from uh, Chicago to San Francisco uh, back in the 60s that uh, was an improv group called the committee. And um, there was a lady uh, who her husband was the guy who owned uh, the the committee and the name and everything else. Well, anyway, Lee French was her name. She was used to be a uh, star on the Smothers Brothers show back in the day. And uh, Lee and I um, can't remember Alan. Uh, got divorced, and she won the name, the committee. And so uh, our, the guys who were in the committee uh, talked her into uh, giving it to her or, or leasing it to them for a dollar uh, for a year, and they did, and they started the committee back up, and they were very funny. Well, she said at the end of the year, says, no, I want it back now. It's mine. I'm taking it away. So uh, they said, <laughs> okay, well, we'll do something else. So they opened a, a group called the uh, the National Theater of the Deranged, and uh, I was uh, very honored to be chosen to be in that group. And we had a marvelous time doing it. Sounds like you fit right in. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. So um, I want to hear a little bit about, uh, you know, so Return to Monkey Island. That was unexpected. And, um, you know, again, I'm coming to this this late in the game, but knowing that, uh, you know, it was... 30 years, Daniel, since Ron had, Ron Ron, yeah. had made the, the first mm -hmm. two and moved on. And then they made a number of uh, versions of the game without him. And then he was able to get the, the rights back or work something out so that he could do another version of his game. Uh, what was your take when you first heard that was uh, that was happening? And, and when did you get the call? And, and you also played some different characters in this one, if I if I recall recall yeah well i i am uh less than privy to I mean, it was just... what exactly is going on and how things are uh, are set up uh it's it's great to you know i'm working with chris again so that's uh, a great thing and uh but i i'm, I'm i am unclear as to where it's going to go uh, i know that the project is uh, is in in mine uh i don't know who is owner or anything else so i'm just along for the ride yeah, it's good. But still, it was a long time between between doing these games. So was it fun to come come back to it after all this time? Oh, it's, it's always fun to know that stuff that you've done is being appreciated by someone. Still, uh, when we 
moved here to Corpus Christi, um, we st struck up a friendship with a couple. Uh, and um, in fact, the, the lady is my wife's best friend. And their son, who is 35, recently married and has his first child. Uh, and when he, when he met me the next time, he came over to the house with a basket full of LucasArts games and said, could you autograph these for me? <laughs> Turns out <laughs> he, had, he had grown up with, he says, I never, I never expected to meet somebody like you. He said, settle down, Sam. It's okay. You know, it's, uh, we'll get it taken care of. But uh, in fact, oh, when, uh, when his son was born, uh, I went out and found uh, something to, uh, uh, for a uh, uh, birthing present, if you want to call it that. But uh, it was a little onesie and uh, said, I am living proof that my father did more than just play video games. <laughs> we need more of those in the world. <laughs> Daniel, that could now, be your next t-shirt. Yeah. Now you've, you've voiced several star Wars projects at LucasArts and you were the narr narrator and you were several characters. How come they didn't give you the voice of Darth Vader? Uh, I'm I'm really not sure, but uh, you know it's uh, that, that's a that's a low reach to get down to that. I have the feeling that uh, you know if they if they couldn't get James Earl Jones, then uh, you know they just had to record somebody normal and probably. But you're you're our James Earl Jones. <laughs> <laughs> that's right, you are. <laughs> no, he's taller and black, so uh, so just so you know. <laughs> <laughs> what are you working on now? Anything exciting that we can can uh, look forward to? Um, like I said, just doing a bunch of auditions for uh, uh, the um, various uh, uh, sporting events that are coming up. And uh, we now have what is the USFL, which uh, is uh, burning up lots of uh, commercial time and that sort of thing. So, uh, no, it's uh, it's I, I like to say I'm semi retired. I don't go hunting for it any anymore. But if something comes flopping over my transom, I'm happy to uh, read an audition. So if they make a, a Murray spinoff, will you be up for it? <laughs> Just as long <laughs> as you have the rights, you know. <laughs> well, speaking of, of uh, this is a good transition. We're, we, we've, we've taken up your time and thank you for, for giving us your time today. Before we let you go, Denny, uh, as, as a favor to us and the small but mighty little YouTube channel that we are uh, we are nurturing, uh, we would love it if you could maybe voice a couple little little uh, promos for our channel uh, as as Murray or as the uh, as one purple of the tentacle. tentacles as a purple tentacle. Would you be open to doing that? I think I could uh, see my way clear to uh, something or other. And then we get to see your your process here. We can see how you go from like seeing it for the first time, like given in a. Uh, you're you know, recording this now. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Conversations with Curtis is a YouTube channel. But is it a demonic YouTube channel? Conversations with Curtis is a YouTube channel. But is it a demonic YouTube channel? <laughs> That's great. Thank you, Dave. That's really wonderful. So amazing. It's like watching history in the mating. <laughs> Please subscribe to Conversations with Curtis and help Paul and Daniel take on the world. <laughs> That's great. It's Thank it's just so as much. fun. It's just as fun watching uh, Daniel, because again, you're his childhood, and <laughs> I'm coming at this from a different. You know, I, I'm loving watching your your uh, your process, but I'm seeing Daniel, the the, the eight year old kid, and Jan Daniel just going like, "Oh my goodness, he's actually saying it out loud." <laughs> <laughs> Well, Danny Delk, thank, thank you, you so me. much for taking time. Yeah, I really appreciate it. Uh, I know we've, we we bounced around with trying to get you on uh, our other channel. So thanks for your patience uh, and, and sticking with us. And uh, and we sure do uh, appreciate all that you've done and, and, and taking the time to talk to us today. Okay. Be well. Thank you, Danny.